It was the, the summer of 1982, over 40 years ago, but I remember it vividly. I was helping lead a, a group of college uh, students on a missions trip to the Philippines, and we were taking an overnight boat from the island of Maspati to Cebu City. Um, the boat had three decks, carried maybe, oh, I don't know, 150 passengers and probably twice that number of pigs and chickens. After we had been on board for about an hour, the sky got dark, the water got choppy, and the boat began to roll back and forth. And soon the winds picked up and the boat was rocking harder and faster. And I remember two emotional stages. First, I was scared. Would this be another wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald? But then stage number two made me forget that concern. I became as sick as I have ever been in my life. If you've never been seasick, really seasick, so you might not understand. And as I hung my head over the railing, I kind of hoped the boat would capsize and end my suffering. After a little while, one, one of the gals in our group, Diane, I don't remember her, her last name, but she gave me a triple dose of Dramamine, and the next thing I knew, it was morning, and the sun was shining, <laughs> and the sea was perfectly calm. Well, that, that brief experience on the high seas helped me realize I was probably not cut out to be a sailor. It also enables me to better relate to our text today. Our journey through Matthew's Gospel brings us to chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 23 through 27. Matthew 8, 23 through 27. You can turn there in your Bible or the words will be on the screen. Here we see what happened one day when Jesus and his disciples were out on a boat and a storm hit. And I hope God will use this passage to help us see the Lord Jesus more clearly, which is something which is always good for our souls, to see Jesus more clearly. And let's just pause and pray the Lord would use his word to speak to our minds and our hearts this morning. Well, Father, thank you for your word. And once again, we pray that you would help these words, your words, um, enter our minds, that we would hear and understand, would enter our hearts, that we would believe, and by your grace we would obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 8, verse 23, And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. Uh, Two weeks ago, we were looking at the previous paragraph. We uh, saw that Jesus decided to escape to the other side of the lake to uh, get away from the crowds. And when Matthew says his disciples followed him, he apparently is referring to Jesus' inner circle. Uh, we don't know how many there were at that time, but, you know, seven, eight, ten, I don't know, somewhere than that, a group of them. Verse 24, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. The boat is on Lake Galilee, or the Sea of Galilee, it's sometimes called. It's also known as the Sea of Gennesaret, or the Sea of Tiberias. It's about 13 miles long and 8 miles across, the largest freshwater body in Israel. The lake was kind of known for violent squalls that would develop very quickly. The surface of the water is more than 600 feet below sea level, and warm air rising off the lake would collide with cooler breezes coming across the plateau, and it could result in instant storms. Verse 24, but he, but Jesus, was asleep. <laughs> Notice that even Jesus, the eternal Son of God, took naps. I like to follow his model. Maybe, maybe you do too. 
The body Jesus had through the miracle of the incarnation was a human one that got tired. His ability to sleep through the storm indicated, indicates not that he had taken a triple dose of Dramamine, but rather that he had full confidence in God's protection. The disciples, however, are not so relaxed. Verse 25, And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. Or the NIV says, we're going to drown. And though they are a bit panicked, the disciples do remember Jesus is the one who can help them. So it's to him they turn. Verse 26, and he said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Uh, Matthew Henry, the wonderful Puritan commentator, wrote, Jesus does not, the does not chide the disciples for disturbing him with their prayers, but for disturbing themselves with their fears. Yes, these disciples really do believe in Jesus. They're, they're willing to follow him, but this incident reveals that their faith is not all that it should be. Though it was a, a, a central part of their lives, they were uh, looking to Jesus to save them, there was still room for their faith to grow. Verse 26, And then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Wow. Yeah, weather can change quickly here in Minnesota, but not, but not this quickly. Uh, though back in verse 20, Jesus said, birds and animals have more shelter than he does. This miracle clearly demonstrates that he is the Lord of nature, the sovereign over weather and over all the physical world. Verse 27, and the men marveled, saying, what kind of man is this? What kind of man is this? that even the winds and the sea obey him. <clears throat> Folks, this story has uh, long been one of my favorites. Uh, when, when I was in grade school, I think it was about fourth or fifth grade, I was in a boys' choir at church. Some of you have a hard time believing that, but I was. And the songs I remember singing were, What a Friend We Have in Jesus and Peace Be Still. And I haven't sung the latter in almost 60 years, but I googled it, and the lyrics are what I remember. The chorus is, the winds and the waves shall obey thy will. Peace be still. Whether the wrath of the storm-tossed sea or struggles of evil, whatever it be, no water can swallow the ship where lies the master of ocean and earth and skies. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace be still. Peace be still. And my memory of that song helped stamp in my mind the disciples' last words, even the wind and the sea obey him. One of the lessons we can draw from this text is that instead of being afraid whenever storms hit, literal or figurative storms, Rather than be afraid, we should turn to and trust the Lord. When one of our, our sons was three or four years old, I was going to mention his name, but he might watch the video here. Um, he was afraid of lightning and, and, and thunder. And, and that was an opportunity for us to teach him and remind ourselves that there is no reason to be afraid when we know the one whom even the winds and waves and lightning bolts obey. And yet, I think Matthew and, and the Lord have a much more important concern than just our reaction to weather. They also want us to ask. They want you to ask, what kind of man is this? What kind of man is this? And, and then they want us to begin to see the answer to that question. Imagine for a moment you are, are one of the disciples who was in the boat. Let's say you're Thaddeus. 
don't know much about Thaddeus, but he was one of the twelve. Thaddeus is in the boat. And earlier, as you had listened to Jesus warn two men, this is back in verses 18 through 22, how hard it can be to follow him, some doubts started to seep into your mind. And, and maybe you begin to wonder, why, why am I doing this? Am I making a mistake? I had a pretty good life as a fisherman back in my, my hometown. What, why am I following this Jesus wherever he goes? And despite those doubts, you, you got in the boat with Jesus. Maybe you weren't even sure why you did. You, you wonder, do I just lack the guts to walk away from him? And then the storm hits. And, and you're, you're scared to death. And along with your friends, you, you call for Jesus to save you, and, and he does. He, he simply speaks, and the winds and the waves obey him. Let me ask, as you continue across the lake on that calm water, Thaddeus, do you still wonder if you made a mistake following Jesus? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. After seeing him calm the storm, you know that this is where you want to be. Oh, you don't know where following him will, will take you. You suspect it might not always be pleasant, but you know, you now know, you're going to follow him wherever he leads. You, you know this is no ordinary man. And you're convinced he is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and you feel ready to trust him with every part of your life. Folks, excuse the pun, but this is the boat the Lord wants each of us to be in this morning. Two weeks ago, as we explored verses 18 through 22, we focused on the fact that being a disciple of Jesus is not always easy. I said that it means if, if we follow Jesus, there will be times when we'll have to sacrifice personal comfort for his sake. There will be times when other people misunderstand and become upset with us. Because a disciple, as a disciple, we're more loyal to Jesus than we are to any other human being. And I said, if we find ourselves in a situation where we are always comfortable, where we are never misunderstood, then we need to check to see if we're really following Jesus. If it's always easy, we need to check and make sure we really are following Jesus and examine our faith to make sure it is genuine because it is not always easy to be a disciple. It is not always easy to be a Christian. And yet, this was my conclusion, it is worth it. It's always worth it. It's always worth it. It's often worth it in this life and surely worth it in eternity. And this morning I would add, it is worth it to follow Jesus simply because Jesus is who he is. Simply because Jesus is who he is. Now, I don't want to make it sound like following Jesus means you have to be a weird person. Some people think a disciple of Jesus has to constantly carry a, around a big black Bible, even bigger than this one, and must always use phrases like hallelujah or praise the Lord at the end of sentences instead of periods. That, that's not true. Jesus does not usually call his followers to live in tar paper shacks or, or to wear clothes that went out of style in the 1980s. He usually doesn't ask his disciples to throw out their televisions or, or quit participating in school sports. He usually does not require Christians to break off friendships with other people just because they're not believers. 
He simply asks that our commitment to follow him be our number one priority. He asks that we never allow anything, recreation, pleasures, or other people, to be, to be more important to us than he is. No, that, that's not always easy. Not always easy, yet as we see Jesus calm that storm, I believe we learn that no matter how tough things get, he's worth following simply because he is who he is. He is the one whom even the wind and the waves obey. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the eternal Son of God. He is worthy of our absolute trust and confidence. Maybe you were here two weeks ago, and as you listened to that sermon, you thought, boy, I, I don't know about this disciple of Jesus stuff. Sure, I, yeah, I, I'm a Christian, but, but I've also worked hard to have a, a comfortable lifestyle. And I, I'm sure not going to risk it by being some kind of religious radical. If that's at all what you've been thinking, please take a closer look at, at this man whom even the winds and the waves obey. Will you really refuse to follow him wherever he leads? Or perhaps you were thinking, Pastor Dan, I don't know, I, I, I don't think you realize how important it is for me to have friends. And I, and I can't do or say anything that my friends at school or work will, will disapprove. Well, again, if that's your attitude, please take a closer look at this man who can calm a storm by just opening his mouth. Are you sure you want to ignore commands he's given? Maybe you have really been trying to follow Jesus, but you're getting tired. You're, you're tired of, uh, of helping people who don't seem to appreciate it. You're, you're tired of being misunderstood by family members because of your, your faith. You're, you're tired of giving lots of time, energy, and money to the church and, and not getting anything back. Well, if, if you're tired, please take a, a closer, a fresh look at Jesus and ask yourself, am I sure I want to give up on this man? Am, am I sure I, I want to stop following him? Folks, I, I'm convinced that if you keep in clear view what kind of person Jesus was and is, it will help you keep following him even when that path becomes difficult. How can we do that? How can we keep this, this clear view of Jesus amidst all of the busyness and, and pressures of life? How, how do you make sure you don't lose sight of Jesus? Well, I think that the best thing you can do is make sure you take time to read and, and study those four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, again, there's much benefit in reading the Old Testament. And those, the rest of that New Testament, those New Testament epistles, those letters, contain essential instructions for Christians today. But it's, it's very important that we spend time reading the Gospels. The, these are the eyewitness accounts of, of those who saw uh, with their own eyes the glory of God in the face of Jesus who with their own ears heard him speak absolute truth, and who with their own hands touched God in human form. The Gospels help us have a clear view of what kind of man Jesus was 
and is. Folks, I think it's good for us to go to read over and over again how Jesus takes sick people and, and simply by touching them makes them well. We need to read over and over again how Jesus can take five loaves of bread and, and, and two small fish and feed over 5,000 people and still have leftovers. We need to read over and over again how Jesus breaks up every funeral he attends. And how even when his friend Lazarus has been dead for three days, Jesus can command him to come out of the tomb. And he does. We need to read frequently the accounts of what is called Holy Week. Jesus' entry in the palm, into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. The Last Supper with his disciples. His arrest, his trial, and then his crucifixion and burial. And then we need to slow down and make sure we do not miss how within three days Jesus conquers death as he triumphantly rises from the dead. As we saturate our minds with, with these texts, it will help us know and remember what kind of man Jesus was and is. It will help us realize that it's worth trusting and following him even when he leads us on paths that seem difficult and uncomfortable. Friend, if for whatever reason you're not sure, you're not sure you really want to trust and, and follow Jesus Christ, I, I challenge you, pick up, pick up a Bible and, and read one of those Gospels and ask yourself, what kind of man is this? You might want to choose the Gospel of Mark because it's the shortest, it's, it's fast moving, fastest moving of the four. However, if you choose to read the Gospel of John, you will encounter perhaps the most powerful piece of writing ever composed on this earth. Anyway, read one of the Gospels. If you do, I'll be praying the Lord opens up your mind and enables you to see who Jesus truly was and is. And I'll also be praying that the Holy Spirit will fill your heart with a desire to trust and follow him. And if you have questions or you're still not sure that's the path you want to take, I'd love to chat, love to talk to you about what kind of man Jesus is. I'd also urge you to keep in mind that the Easter season we are in, Palm Sunday next week, provides us as Christians with an opportunity to encourage others to see what kind of man Jesus was and is. A recent survey found that 82% of Americans celebrate Easter in some way, but most of them do not really connect it with the resurrection of Jesus. 82% celebrate Easter in some way, but for the majority of those, it's really not connected with the resurrection of Jesus. Though more people go to church on Easter than any other Sunday of the year, it is viewed by many as a time of gathering with family members and friends to enjoy a special meal. We need to remind people of the why of the Easter season. Of what the death and, and resurrection of Jesus really means. It, it's a good time to ask folks why they do what they do at Easter. Are you going to church on Easter Sunday? If, if so, why? If not, why not? And eventually you, you want to ask, do you believe that Jesus really rose from the dead that first Easter Sunday? If, if not, why not? If you do, what significance do you see in that for your life? Wait a second, Pastor Dan, I'm not a, I'm not a pastor like you. I, I, I get real nervous telling other people about my faith. Well, let, let me mention some things that 
I hope can be helpful. A couple things. Um, number one, I'm not so much urging you to tell people about Christianity, but suggesting that you ask questions. That was a technique Jesus often used in talking with others, and it seems to be the most effective way to communicate with people in the 21st century. Now, some people will have no interest in answering any questions, but most people are willing to talk about their favorite topic, what they think on various issues. Most people will talk about that. Remember to not just ask people what they think, but also why they think it. You'll find many folks really haven't explored that second question, why they think it. Make sure you listen to the answers that other people give. And then, at that point, often he or she will ask, well, what do you think about that? And then you have an opportunity to talk about why you choose to trust and follow Jesus. Now, there's no guarantee that this is the route a conversation will travel, but you can pray that it will. Ask questions. Secondly, make sure you tell your children and grandchildren about the true meaning of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Kids usually are not very intimidating, and often they're quite interested in learning what occurred on Good Friday and on that first Easter Sunday. Perhaps you can pick up a, a book or a video that will help you explain what happened and, and when Jesus was crucified on the cross and within three days rose from the dead. It's very sad that there are many children and even teens who, who uh, do not know about, are, are completely ignorant of the events we commemorate on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. They do not know about Jesus' death and resurrection and the significance of what are really the two most important days in human history. Conversations you have with your children, with your grandchildren, maybe your nieces and nephews, those conversations can help make sure they know what really happened on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Folks, during the, the Super Bowl, the, the He Gets Us campaign showed a commercial portraying Jesus washing the feet of all, all sorts of different people. There's been a, a lot of discussion, and, and though I saw significant flaws in the commercial, I would agree that, yes, Jesus gets us. Jesus gets us. But the real important question is, do we get him? Friend, do you understand who Jesus is? Do you realize what his life, his death, and his resurrection mean for you and for your life? Again, if you're not sure, we need to chat. If you do know who Jesus is, and what it means for your life as you trust in him as Savior and Lord, I encourage you to, to share that with others, and I encourage you to celebrate who Jesus is.